Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 31 of the Gaming Rules podcast, where I talk about the games that I've been playing and other things that I've been up to. First of all, apologies for the audio quality of this podcast. It is lower than normal, and this is due to my normal microphone that I use for all my recordings suddenly going faulty when I just when I needed it to film a new video. The new one's ordered and won't arrive till next week, but I didn't want to delay things any further. Speaking of delays, yeah, this podcast is a little bit late again. As some of my regular followers will know, uh, and in fact I mentioned it in the last podcast, I actually got ill. And although I got over the worst of it a couple of weeks ago, it's kind of knocked me for six, and I've not really been functioning properly since then. This means that I've been getting behind on everything and still feeling very run down and tired all the time, etc. But anyway, enough about my health issues, on with the gaming. As I mentioned last time, I was extremely happy that this podcast was nominated for a Golden Geek Award, um, which came as a bit of a surprise. I knew I had no chance of winning it, that was fine, but it was great to be up there with some of the really, really good podcasts that are out there. Um, And since Podcast 30, the winners have been announced, and the Secret Cabal podcast won. Good job, guys. Well deserved. Speaking of the Golden Geek Awards, as usual, I agree with some of them and disagree with others. But, to be honest, this is the same for all awards that come out, and I'm sure most other people are in the same position. I, For example, I found that the Splendor app, which won Best Board Game App, I think, um, I just found it a really, really bad app. I thought the AI was terrible. I beat all of the different AIs the first time I played it when I was actually learning how to play. So I was making pretty much random moves and managed to beat all of the AIs. The little challenges that come with the game, I just I just felt that they weren't very well thought out. Some of them were a bit broken and just not very interesting. So yeah, I was a bit surprised to see that that one won Best Board Game App. Anyway, moving on, if you want to engage with me, if you like anything that you hear in this podcast or disagree with anything, I do want to hear people's thoughts. The best place is on the BGG Guild, which is Guild number 2258. Now, guilds can be a bit tricky to find and join on BoardGameGeek, but if you want to know how, then just drop me a tweet or a Facebook message or something like that, and I'll let you know. But if you are a user of BoardGameGeek, please join the guild, subscribe, and join in the conversations that are going on there. Thanks, as always, to the sponsors of the show, GamesLaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com. Special guest. So those people who are on the Guild are probably expecting Vlaja to come on the show at this point, because I was supposed to be interviewing him for this podcast. However, I haven't been able to make that happen, unfortunately. Vlaja simply has no time at the moment for anything. And despite me spending four days over in the Czech Republic with the CGE team, testing and developing new games, there actually wasn't the opportunity to interview him at the time, believe it or not. There were very late nights developing. And I was still feeling really ill and just not really up to it. I'm not ruling out interviewing him at some point in the future, and the questions that people posted on the Guild were good ones, and Vlodja did tell me that he's actually read through them. But, he's, as I say, he's not been able to find time to do the interview, so maybe another time. So instead, I've asked Jonathan Cox to come on the show. Some people might know him better as John from John Gets Games, and if you don't know John's work, he's another content creator for YouTube, with his own channel, John Gets Games. He does reviews and playthroughs. The production quality is exceptional, which is why I started taking an interest in him myself. So welcome to the show, John. Hey, how's it going? Good, good, good. So first of all, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Uh, Sure. I am a big-time board gamer, but I'm also... Um, I guess my regular Joe thing is that I work in the event industry, and I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, yeah, I spend uh, most of my nights and weekends plugging in lights, and most of my weekdays filming things for uh, for board games. Which comes in handy when you actually start making your own videos for YouTube, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. In fact, that's kind of how this whole st- thing started. I Most of my friends have day jobs uh, during the middle of the week, like most people do, and I would get really bored uh, in the middle of the day. I just kind of go crazy wishing I could be playing board games or doing something instead of sitting on the couch by myself. So um, one day, almost exactly two years ago actually, um, I just got fed up and I pulled my iPhone out of my pocket and filmed a review for Tuluva just to prove that I could, mostly to solve my boredom. And I've kind of been going ever since. Yeah, so so it was a couple of years ago, and didn't you say in a previous conversation that I've had with you that it wasn't, it didn't start off as John Gets Games? He started off called something else. Uh, yeah, well, actually, I have another YouTube channel called John Gets Bored. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, just a minute ago, like I used to get very bored. And I, on here, I put 
uh, all, a whole bunch of different types of videos. In fact, I had a few time lapses of board games. I got a GoPro, and so the thing I did is I stuck it to the ceiling and like took a time lapse of us playing Eclipse or you know that kind of thing. But I also had videos of me like racing a car and going paragliding and doing all sorts of things I used to do to try and solve my boredom. Um, right. But once I started John Gets Games. I don't really have boredom problems anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so John Gets Bored, the YouTube channel, is has not been updated for a while. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say, yeah. <laughs> okay. So how has John Gets Games evolved then over the two years? Uh, well, it's evolved quite a bit, actually. Um, you know, in the very beginning, the very first one I did was just me holding my iPhone and kind of talking at it haphazardly. And as I've gone on, as I started doing the videos, I realized, I really thought about what I wanted to see in videos that I wasn't necessarily seeing. And that, that was, the biggest thing was a rigid structure of like what you're talking about. So like, you know, first I'm gonna talk about, you know, the replayability and then I'll talk specifically about the player count and that kind of thing. And that's evolved over time. Like in the beginning, I just talked about things I liked and then things I didn't like. And then I talked about things I liked, some neutral things and things I didn't like. And after a while, Somebody online, actually, on Reddit, I remember seeing, they were talking about, what do you want to see in uh, YouTube videos? And one person said, nobody ever talks about replayability. So I said, I'll talk about replayability. And so I started putting that into my videos. And um, so it's just, I've kind of built up kind of an outline uh, structure that I fit uh, pretty much every one of my reviews into, which I guess some might seem as being a little restrictive, but I like it as a nice guiding point to just talk about each phase of the game. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned earlier on that it was, it was you know, watching your videos, which got me uh, interested and I obviously reached out to you and made contact and we've sort of become friends and I think that the two, the two main reasons why why I like the videos is that they they were professionally produced they looked good the lighting was correct and everything else and the structure was good the fact that you covered a brief overview of the rules which if you know the rules of the game you just skip that bit but if you want to know a basic overview you can listen to it then you covered what you liked and what you didn't like and I just thought yeah that that's good and for me that kind of review you know in that structured format that just worked the best for me and obviously other people like that too so it yeah, seems that's like good. It. I mean the other I guess uh, thing that I do that most people other other people don't do is putting timestamps in so that you could skip to the yeah. part that you like because that's another thing that I wish I I could see in other YouTube videos because like you said you know you you get your little scrubby thing out and kind of scan forward with your mouse to see where they stop explaining the game where they start talking about what they liked and didn't like and I was just fed up with that. So I just, you know, put in there, you know, skip to 13 minutes and 56 seconds to, uh, to start the review. And, uh, yeah, just that's another thing that evolved over time. Um, you know, at first it was just annotations in YouTube. And then one of my friends said, hey, I don't see those in uh, when I look at your videos on an iPad. So I just started hard rendering the numbers in there. It just I, Every single thing you see in my videos has been incrementally added in over time as I just kind of try to make it better. I hope it doesn't look like a Frankenstein's monster at this point, though. <laughs> And where do you see it going in the next couple of years then? Um, uh, that is an interesting question because I really enjoy doing this stuff. Uh, and, you know, most people who do content on YouTube say, oh, you know, I wish I could do this for a living. I wish people would pay me to do this. And that's definitely the case for me. I mean, I would, I would love to be doing this full time, but that's not necessarily feasible. So where I see myself going is just trying to keep consistency, uh, the consistent uh, content going. Like last year, I think I averaged about one video every two weeks. And this year, I'm really trying to do two videos a week, which is a wow. lot more than it last is, yeah. year. <laughs> and you know, as things get busier with my real work, uh, that's probably gonna go down to one video a week. But I figure even that is way more consistent than previous times. So I'm just, I'm trying to do that. Actually, a, a better answer to that question, I guess, is I'm trying to in increase the variety of stuff on my channel. Like I've always done, some vlogs sometimes, and about last year I started doing full playthroughs, but like a smattering of them, and this year I'm really trying to like almost keep it equal, like have okay. um, you know a same number of reviews as playthroughs, because I don't know, I, I like reviews, but to a certain extent sometimes I, I have way more fun watching other people play the game in a YouTube video than just hearing them talk about what they think about it, so I just try to think about what I like to see and try to make more of that stuff. Okay, so yeah, so you're happy with the, with the format, you're just doing more of it. Essentially, yeah, and I'm sure if uh, we had this conversation two years from now, I'd probably talk about all the things that I've changed because, you know, because <laughs> things pop up because, you know, I read Reddit and somebody says, why doesn't somebody do this? And I say, well, I'll be that person. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So on to the games that you cover in the show. As you mentioned, you do cover a very wide range of games from light to heavy. What would you say is your preferred type of game? If you could just choose one, for example. Sure, sure. I think... Uh, Light to medium weight Euro is, is okay. like, like really my favorite. Like 60 to 90 minute 
lots of indirect player interaction, uh, cool mechanics going on. Like, that's really my favorite kind of thing. Like I, I do enjoy lighter games sometimes, and I enjoy heavier games that might go over two hours. But you know, if somebody told me you can only play one kind of game forever, it would definitely be you know, a 75-minute Euro. Yeah. Okay. And your favorite designers, then, if you could pick a few? Uh, yeah. So uh, this is an interesting question. You know, my first uh, answer was Alexander Pfister, because I'm just really into the stuff that he's making lately, like Isle of Sky, and um, uh, Port Royal came out a little while ago, and he's done lots of different stuff. In fact, Royal Goods is one of his most recent ones, which I didn't even like that much, but I still just respect the designer and the mechanics okay. that he was going for so much that I, I just doesn't really tarnish my opinion. Uh, I was looking at, uh, there's this pretty cool website called Friendless Stats, and it uh, kind of crunches a whole bunch of things based off of the information you put about board games into it on Board Game Geek, and it tells me that my favorite designer is Vlada Shvatel. <laughs> Does it? No. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't, uh, I'm not too surprised, uh, but you know, as far as average ratings and number of ratings and all that, uh, Vlada is at the top, and I think that's not too surprising. My favorite game ever is uh, Through the Ages, um, and you know, I've played the heck out of code names. Yeah. And this one surprised me. My second favorite designer, according to Friendless Stats, is Reiner Knizia. Oh, right. Okay. I, I didn't expect that. Um, but I think it's mostly just because I've played so many of his games because he's designed so many games. And on average, I like them. I, I don't love them on average, but when you have a big average of games that you like, well, that's why it pops up there. <laughs> right. So if you can send me the link, then I will put that in the show notes and I'll put it on the uh, on the enhanced YouTube version of this podcast just so uh just so others can have a look at that yeah sounds good so excellent um right so i think that's pretty much about it for you on the show as the special guest is there anything else you wanted to tell people uh no i don't think so okay so we'll wrap this part up as i say if you're interested in the stuff that john does his youtube channel is john gets games all one word and uh, thanks for being the special guest yeah no problem what paul has played so, the games that I've been playing over the last few weeks that I am allowed to talk about, because of course I spent four days in the Czech Republic and uh, some of that stuff is still secret at the moment, um, but one game I did play was Istanbul, which I haven't talked about before on the podcast. Now, I hadn't played this for ages, and we played five players with a random setup of the tiles, and... I actually enjoyed it. It was better than I remember. When I played it the first few times, I kind of thought, oh, is, that, is that really it? And kind of went off it a bit. But coming back to it after a bit of a break with, with a random setup of the tiles, um, yeah, better than I remember. Have you played this one, John? I have. I played it once uh, at Board Game Geek Con two years ago. And right. I've not played it since. And a big part of that is because I had a similar opinion to it as... I guess old Paul. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I played it once, and I was like, "Oh, that's it." Uh, yeah, I, the, the main mechanic of the game is you you place uh, people out um, kind of in an, an orthogonal trail, and then you can pull them back up in that same path. And I just I kind of felt like I was doing a thing, and then I was doing it again. Like the game kind of forced me into doing everything twice. And yeah. I know that's not necessarily the case because you can do other things to skip over and. And that, that's a very much an oversimplification, but I don't know. It didn't really wow me that much. I also didn't do very well in that game. And that, <laughs> I, mean, I do enjoy games that I'm bad at, but I just remember that one particular play. I kind of ended it, and I was like, I don't think I need to play that again. So for your first game, did you use the recommended startup of we the did. 16 locations? Yeah, yeah we you did. See, that's, that's what I did, and I always use that with new people. And maybe that's what got me unstuck, because I'd use that same setup. And on that setup, there are like three sort of ways to win and when you discover one of them it's a bit boring you're like oh well I'll go there to get money and then I'll go there to spend the money on the gem and then I'll go back there to get money and then I'll go back there to when you're using the random setup those sort of connections don't really happen so you really have to look at the board and decide ah oh, you know where am I going to go what what sort of strategy am I going to use with this particular setup and it does make the game varied but at the end of the game it's a light game possibly light to medium but certainly on the lighter end of it that doesn't take long to play and is actually suitable as a gateway game, which is what I bought it for. Um, but, you know, we had like an hour and a bit spare, so we dug it out and we enjoyed it. So it was good. So that's Istanbul. On the same night, we played Castles of Burgundy, the card game, which has just come out in the UK. I'm a huge fan of Castles of Burgundy, probably in my top 10 games. I think I rate it maybe a 9.5 or possibly even a 10 on Board Game Geek. Um, so we played the card game. And disappointing is unfortunately the word that I was going to use. Maybe because I love the board game so much and I didn't feel that this was as good as the board game. Um, 
but it seemed a little bit fiddly in places, and the amount of table space that it took up for a card game, there was cards all over the place, and in your own player area, you have three distinct areas, each of which has loads of cards in it, and I was basically like, this is taking up more space than the board game. There just seemed to be lots of different cards all over the place. Um, Have you had a chance to have a look at this one yet, John? Uh, Yeah, I was really interested in it when I first heard about it, uh, because... I, I used to own Castles of Burgundy. Uh, I bought right. it about the time when it first came out because it looked really great. And I ended up selling it to one of my best friends who is technically my next door neighbor because I knew it would stay in my friend group and there was no reason for it to have two copies and one, okay. one group of friends. And yeah, um, I, I sold it because I didn't really get it out that much uh, for an interesting reason compared to what you just said. I found it really fiddly uh, to like okay. to set up. Like the, the, just the setup oh, like is, yeah. getting your little tiles and your little piles and it just there's a whole bunch of stuff going all over the place. It seemed like everyone I played it with loved it and I would just sit there and I'm like, yeah, this is okay. I'm having an okay time but um, I just found I wasn't terribly excited to play anymore which is why I'm, I was interested in the card game because I liked a lot of the things that were going on but for some reason it didn't click into the uh, love status for me. Uh, so I, I watched a playthrough, um, I can't remember the name of the guy, but uh, a German guy who did a, a playthrough in English, uh, put okay. it on Board Game Geek. I watched that, and I find myself continuing to be intrigued. I don't think I'm going to run out and buy it, but I like, I mean, this sounds crazy, because a big part of Castles of Burgundy is that player map that you uh, kind of randomly get, and the card game doesn't have that. And I kind of like that idea, um, because I feel like that was just like an extra layer that I didn't necessarily need on top of it in the card game it seems like you're just trying to make sets of the different you're colors. just trying to make sets of three yeah of, of that particular type and when you get a set of three you get a bonus in fact it only scores at the end of the game when you've got a set of three so yeah there's a lot of things in the card game that work in a similar way to the board game but i just felt that it i don't know maybe i need to play it again but it's not one that you know with with limited time i'm, I'm happy to have played it once Yes, I formed an opinion about it. Lots of people might disagree and say it's amazing, but I don't know. I, I think I'd prefer to play the board game. It does probably play quicker than the board game, but I, you know, would I play that twice or would I play the board game once? I'd play the board game once. So I think yeah. that makes sense. I think that's pretty understandable too. Uh, I hope to have an opportunity to play it, but I don't see myself going out to buy it. Yeah. So what? Uh, give us a game that you've played recently. Uh, a week or two ago, I played The Big Book of Madness, which... Uh, came out at Essen last year, Yeah, that's correct, uh, uh, from ILO Games, and yep. it's a fully cooperative deck-building game. Uh, and I know that this is not the first of that style, but it, there certainly aren't that many cooperative deck-building games out there, yeah. which had me pretty interested. Also, the theme is just wonderful. I mean, it's, you know, you're a bunch of uh, magic students in a magic school, and you go into the Forbidden Library and open a book you shouldn't, and out pops a whole bunch of... Uh, evil elemental spirits and you spend the whole game trying to close the book like that's that's all you're trying to do is fight all these things that are creeping out of this magic book which is just a fun idea um, and then mechanically the way it works is you essentially have um, let's see I think you have six overall rounds and you have everybody has about five turns per round and you have those five turns to uh, to kind of kill the one monster that is kind of creeping out of the book and you have I think six monsters you have to get rid of and what you're trying to do is the monsters put out a bunch of curses that you have to break by essentially putting out different sets of, um, of magic. You know, there's four different colors of magic, red, green, blue, yellow, and uh, or actually white instead of yellow. But anyway, and what it means is you are just trying to like have like four yellow power to play that down to kill that one, um, oh gosh, the white power, <laughs> the wind power to kill that one curse that came out. And it, it's very puzzly because the curses fall out in several turns ahead. So you could see, you know, okay, on my turn, we have to defeat this curse that's, you know, for uh, green. And then on the next person's turn, it's going to be one of each of the colors. And on the following turn after that, we need to get um, four red. Okay, so you, you can see ahead then. You can plan ahead. Exactly. It's essentially, the game is like six puzzles. Uh, when, you, when you get around those five turns and you reveal the next page, the next monster, it presents you a five-turn puzzle. And you need to figure out how you're going to get through those next five turns, try and get rid of all those curses. And if you get rid of all of them, then you defeated the monster and you get a bonus. If you don't get rid of all of them, then you just get a penalty. You don't actually lose the game if you don't defeat that one monster. But it really is just a game of attrition. You need to get through all of the monsters and end the game. And the last monster is not special. Like, all of them are random. So it's just... It's just, if you defeat that final monster, then you win, and if you don't defeat the final monster, you lose. And so really the challenge of the game is making good decks while also 
surviving uh, <laughs> and you know not continually being beaten down by the monsters and I only played it once and we lost pretty hard I think in like maybe the fifth turn so we got kind of well on the way but at that point it was very obvious we did not have a chance because our decks were just not powerful enough they were full of gunk and also that's another thing the game has is this madness mechanic where they're just uh, a madness card that gets put into your deck every time you reshuffle. So a lot of um, a lot of deck builders, you know, every deck builder you reshuffle all the time. This one yeah. actually penalizes you for reshuffling too much okay. because the um, that madness card is just a dead card. Like there's nothing on it. It's just when you have it in your hand, it's bad. And if anyone draws a hand of all madness cards, they're actually eliminated from the game because they go <laughs> crazy, uh, which is kind of fun. I mean that that didn't come close to happening for us, but. Um, altogether, it was a pretty good time. Uh, like a big group puzzle, definitely um, uh, susceptible to alpha player syndrome yep. because everybody's hand is face up, okay. and it's just it's just a puzzle. So kind of everybody's trying to figure out the puzzle, and whoever figures out the puzzle first, well, they kind of tell everybody, okay, you do this and you do this, and then if you do that, then we use that magic spell, and then we'll be fine in three turns. And so, where does it fit on the heaviness scale then? Um, it's not light, but I, I'm maybe like the the heavier end of light. Uh, okay. or, or the lighter end of medium. It's it's like right near that point. I think the game took 45 minutes uh, for our loss, so I can see okay. a win being like a little over an hour. Suitable for non-gamers? Um, I potentially, like with the theme and the art and everything, that's going to pull people in, but it's a bit intimidating when you first put it out on the table. There are, you know, like 10 different stacks of sorted cards. There's, uh, everybody has an individual asymmetric player power, and then you can get new spells that let you do different things. I would not... I would say it's good for a gateway game for somebody you know is up for a bit of a challenge, but I would right, not. Okay. I would not introduce this to my mom. <laughs> okay. And you would play this again then? I would. Yeah, it's at a, a local uh, board gaming cafe, so I look forward to trying it again next time I go down there. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I've heard nothing bad about this game. In fact, I've heard quite a lot of people saying it was good. I just don't know anybody who owns it. Therefore, I've not had chance to play it myself. It does sound like though that the game could have become with a Cthulhu setting i'm not saying it should because we've got far too many cthulhu games anyway yeah and it's kind of nice that we've got but with the whole well there's monsters and there's curses and there's madness madness <laughs> and there's things like this it could have easily been set in cthulhu but yeah it's nice it's nice that it's not um so one other game i've played recently a friend of mine came over to stay for a couple of days and i've gone on before about elysium and really like Elysium. So I said to him, as he had he played it? And he hadn't. So I said, oh, you've got to play it. It's really, really good. Clever mechanics. So we played a two-player game of Elysium, and I probably won't play a two-player game of Elysium again. It just didn't work anywhere near as good as the... Well, yeah, I've played it three and four player in the past. But with two players, you get your deck of cards at the start of the game, which is five, the five gods that you've chosen to play with, 21 cards in each god, you shuffle the deck together, you've got your 105 card deck. In a two-player game, you only draw seven cards off that deck each round, so you're only seeing a third of the cards in the deck, making it a lot more prone to the look of, of, of what comes out. So, for example, in our game, we both needed a yellow two, and if you were playing four players, then lots of them would come out. There's a chance that they won't, but a lot smaller chance. Whereas in our game, only one yellow two came out. And, I, I, I don't know, the, there wasn't much interaction, the order of passing wasn't as important... And yeah, basically, it sort of worked as a two-player game, but it's not something that I would I would choose to do again. So that was a little bit disappointing. There seemed to be a, a running stream of me being disappointed with games at the moment. But <laughs> as I say, Elysium, I think, is a great game, and I really, really enjoy playing it. Just didn't really enjoy it two-player. I've only played it two- and three-player, and both of those plays I found pretty disappointing, to be honest. Right. Uh, uh, the two-player, especially for all the reasons you just said. Oh, okay. Um, and the three-player game... I don't know, I think I was expecting a little more excitement from a game about, you know, crazy gods and beautiful artwork, and then I just always felt like the cards themselves, the actions on them, were a bit dull in comparison to the theme that the game was trying to portray. Right. But I am hoping to play a four-player game. I own it, and I haven't done an official review of it because I just I feel like i got to play it four-player before I can really sure. hone in on what I really think about the game. Yep. And... Back to you. Another game that you've played. Uh, well, another one I played recently is La Isla, which is a game I've actually played a bunch of times, like well over 10 times. I, I bought it uh, pretty soon after it came out in 2014. This is a Stefan Feld game. I think 
somewhat widely regarded as his lightest game, at least the lightest, lightest game yeah. he's, he's done in, in several years, uh, many years. He's, he did a few tiny games many years ago. But anyway, La Isla, it's got a really great mechanic. Uh, the, the way it works is you have this humongous stack of cards, and every card has three different aspects to it. There is an ongoing power uh, on the card. There is a cube color on the card, and then there's finally a endgame victory point um, symbol on the card. So those are the three things. And you are explorers on an island just trying to capture these indigenous uh, animals that are on the island. It's like uh, frogs and moths and pumas and that kind of stuff. And uh, what you do on each turn, the game is almost entirely simultaneous, which is a thing I really like uh, more and more as I go through the years of board gaming because it can keep downtime low. And on every turn, all you do is you draw three cards. And again, all three cards have those three different aspects to it. And you choose one card to be attributed with each of those three aspects. So one okay. of those three cards will be a special ongoing power that you have access to uh, for as long as that you have it. Another card will just, you'll discard it to get a cube of that color. And the last card will bump up a victory um, uh, point uh, modifier for that one animal. So you, everybody's sitting there thinking, looking at the three cards, trying to figure out what power is good? Okay, well, if I do this card for a power, then I'm left with these other two cards, but oh, I don't like the cube color on either of those, and I like the cube color on the special power, so maybe I don't do the special power to get the cube, and it just, it's got a bunch of um, uh, short-term versus long-term, uh, long-ish term planning, because this is not a long game. Like, uh, the first time I played it was four players, and it involved me skimming the rule book, and we were still done in like 50 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so it's not a very long game, especially for Stefan Feld, and that's a good and a bad thing. Uh, the, good th the good part of it is that um, it doesn't last too long, and you're kind of you're on for that 50 minutes. Like there's very little downtime, so you're pretty much going the whole time. The issue is that it can be definitely susceptible to randomness. So that's definitely my biggest issue with the game is luck of the draw. It's a great little puzzle to figure out well the three cards, you know, which one do you put into which of these three slots. But when the game usually only lasts about nine to ten turns, if you get like three or four really poor hands, well that's like a third to a half of the game. Of, of just, you know, kind of, and then you look across the table and somebody else is just getting the perfect cards for them. You know, they, they keep capturing frogs and they keep drawing cards that let them increase the number of victory points the frogs are worth. And you right. keep capturing okay. moths and you cannot draw a moth card to save your life. But you've played <laughs> it 10 times and you would play it again. I would. I'm not excited to play it um, at this point. I think I'm starting to get near the end of my uh, replayability life for the game. Uh, but it is just really nice for like uh, end of the night kind of game you know if you like ah oh, you know everybody's only got like four one more game left in them it, it can't be too hard 40 minutes well you can slam this game down play it and it, it is a good time it just it, it feels i don't know almost like cribbage where it's like 30 percent of the game is really good play and 70 percent of the game is just the cards you get <laughs> okay i mean it, it's possible i need to look up this stat but i think it might be the only stefan feld game that i haven't played oh wow and the reason is that I'd heard it was a bit lighter than all of his others, and I like all of his others. Yeah. So I've kind of not really been that interested in playing it. Saying that, I've got some friends that own it, and they really like it, so it is something that I do need to play. As you say, I just need to, like, like Istanbul, I need to go, right, tell you what, we've got an hour left at the end of the night, let's play this. And, and it, it will probably be perfectly good to fit into that that category. Yep, I think I, I really recommend you give it a shot. Um, and as, as if you go in knowing that card luck, uh, card draw luck is a thing, you'll be yep. less likely to be annoyed by it if it I'll, happens. I'll be to less you. table flippy uh, <laughs> about it. Yeah. So uh, anyway, right. So that's that's some of the games that we've been playing over the last couple of weeks. If you've got any uh, any comments for us, if you agree or disagree with anything that we've said, then please pop onto the BGG Guild um, and uh, and and talk away there. So thanks very much for joining me on the what have we played section John it's been good to have you on the show yeah it's been a really good time and I'll talk to you soon you got it gaming rules news well, unfortunately, uh, due to the illness and other things, I've got very little to report. So everything that I was working on before is still in progress. The Zolkin video is still being worked on, but it's going slowly. Um, I've been helping out with some game development uh, of games that I can't really talk about at the moment. And I've been doing quite a bit of rulebook writing and editing for, for various companies. Um, I've also managed to film a short video last week for one of the best games which I think is coming out this year. Now that video is due to go live on Friday, so uh, it's a bit of a secret, so keep an eye on the YouTube channel this Friday for that. 
Um, I've also been trying to finalise all of the stuff for the UK Games Expo. Now, UK Games Expo is the UK's largest gaming event that we have. Thousands of people. It's been running for 10 years. It's extremely good. And I've been running the CGE booth there for the last five years now, I think. But unlike previous years, where basically it was a couple of tables and me and a few friends doing some demos, this year we've got a five metre by five metre area with five tables, 20 chairs. So I've had a whole lot more prep to do regarding the logistics, sorting out shelving and banners, etc, etc. If you are going to the UK Games Expo, please call into the CGE booth and say hi. It's in the main exhibitors hall and we're going to have prototypes of all of the new CGE games to show people. Thanks again to the sponsors of the show, Games Law, and also to Jason Shaw at audionautics.com for the music used in this podcast. And thanks again to John from John Gets Games for taking the time out to come on the podcast as a special guest. Take care, and thanks for listening.